this one's about securing information systems. So after reading this chapter, we should be able to understand why information systems are vulnerable to destruction, error, and abuse. There's a lot of sources for problems. Some of them are, you know, people, internal to the company, external to the company. Some of them are, are man-made. Some of them are not man-made, things like natural disasters or obsolescence. Uh, so there's a lot of sources for, for these uh, for information system uh, vulnerabilities. We'll talk about what is the business value of, of security and control. It's a cost center. It costs money to protect your system. So it, it, it encourages companies to not spend money on security. Why would you spend money on something that you don't get any money back from? Well, if you have a data breach, you then realize that maybe you ought to spend a little money on it. Uh, what are the components of an organizational framework for security and control? What are the most important tools and technologies for safeguarding information resources? So we'll talk about all of those. It starts out talking about Facebook. And I, I was reading the chapter last night, and I thought it was kind of interesting because I was up kind of late and didn't, just kind of had the TV on for background noise. And there was a story that came on uh, CN, CNBC last night about Facebook. And it was really kind of interesting. It was an hour-long special, and they were talking about the pros of, of Facebook, the cons of Facebook. It was really interesting. There was a, a lady that was looking for her parents, her biological parents, and uh, used Facebook to be able to find, find them. Uh, so it was a success story. Then there was another one where a school teacher who was frustrated with some of her students and you know, just kind of jokingly posted something to Facebook. Next thing she knew, she was asked to resign. So that's kind of the pros and the cons of things that you can post in such a public forum. So careful about doing stuff like that. Identity theft and malicious software uh, are, are problems with somebody like Facebook. It's a big company with a lot of consumer data. What does that mean? It's a honeypot. It's a, a big target. It's an attractive target to people looking for information about consumers. You get emails that, that come into you that look like they're from Facebook, asking you for to log in and provide certain information. We're updating our system. Please log in and update your information. That's how they get passwords. And just kind of snowballs from there. Uh, so it kind of illustrates some of the attacks that we'll be talking about today in terms of uh, things like uh, phishing and spam and all these various things that that get used that we see every day that we can we can fall prey to. And if, if you're smart, if you just take a few basic uh, uh, approaches and looking at, at the emails that you get, the programs that you use, things like that, the websites that you visit, just a few simple steps can really make your life a little bit easier. So we'll talk about some of that. So system vulnerability and abuse. Security is defined as policies, procedures, and technical measures used to prevent unauthorized access, alteration, theft, or physical damage to information systems. So we develop policies. What kind of policies? Can you think of an example of a policy that we might use to secure our systems? Employees can't take data out of the system. Yeah, I mean, that, there's actually a news story several years ago about stuff like that. You take home a laptop, it's got a lot of important information. The laptop gets stolen. All that data is gone. We're not talking about hard drives with 10 meg anymore. We're talking about gigabyte hard drives, terabyte hard drives. That's a lot of potential data that gets, gets lost. Um, password policies, how often you have to change your password. Something else. Uh, technical measures, the complexity of your passwords, making sure that they're eight characters or more, uppercase, lowercase, special characters. Um, present unauthorized access, alteration, theft, or physical damage to information systems. So security includes things like making sure that you don't put your server down in a, in a basement where it might flood, or in some, some way ensuring that it won't flood. Uh, trying to make sure that if you're in a, a tornado-ridden area, that it's not on the exterior wall where it's more likely that, that you might lose information. One of the ways that we try to protect ourselves from these various issues is through controls. Depending on the text that you're reading or, or the, the magazine that you might be reading, controls might be might be described as countermeasures. Things that you can put in place to try to protect some of those things. Um, so software things that will look at your password to make sure it meets that minimum limit. Um, those policies that you actually develop. Uh, things like that that will help you, out, help you out. So why systems are vulnerable? Accessibility of networks. 
we connect everything to the internet anymore. Why? Because it's convenient. It makes it really easy. We get more customers if everything's connected to the internet because they can log in, they can check the status of their orders. They can order products 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we want to connect everything to the internet. We even connect our HR stuff to the internet. People can log in from anywhere and check their benefits, enroll in programs at work, things like that. So accessibility of networks, everything is connected. Once upon a time, so, uh, mainframes were locked away in, back, in a back room. Nobody ever touched them except a few people. Uh, that's pretty secure for the most part. But when we start connecting everything to the Internet, it means there's 6 billion people potentially that, that could become hackers. Hardware problems, breakdowns, configuration errors, damage from improper use or crime. Obsolescence, things break. It's just it's the nature of, 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 of electronics and mechanical devices. Uh, configuration errors, even as technical as, as computer technicians can be, they can't be experts in everything. They're going to click, they're going to make mistakes, and they're going to click on the wrong thing. They're going to not completely understand a particular configuration setting. Several years ago, I don't remember which site it was, it was eBay or, or somebody like that, that was down for several hours because of a DNS configuration error. Somebody just configured a, a router incorrectly. And, and that's all it takes. Disaster or software problems, programming errors, installation errors, unauthorized changes. You know, people make coding errors and, and the program doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Disasters, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, and you end up with rivers and, and stuff like that that come out of their banks and have all kinds of problems. If you put a data center in Florida, you probably ought to put in certain systems to help protect you from hurricanes. Uh, use of networks and computers outside of firms' control. Somebody brings in their own laptop from home. That certainly gives them an opportunity to copy a lot of data, put it on their personal computer, and walk out the front door with a lot of personal or proprietary data. Uh, and loss of theft of portable devices. They're portable. They get lost. They get dropped. They get broken. They get stepped on. They get stolen. So places where you might have some of these, these, these issues, really everywhere. I mean, you, you can have the problem yourself on your end at the client side. Somebody else sits down at your computer, you get up, you, you walk off for a few minutes, you didn't log out, you don't lock your machine. Somebody now has unauthorized access with your account information. Uh, in the transmission area, when you're communicating back to a server or to a web server or wherever, you're sending data back and forth, so that's a potential place where you, you become vulnerable. The corporate servers and the corporate backend stuff, they store a lot of that information. In a lot of cases, they store your credit card numbers. They store information about human resources, where you work, various benefits that you receive, things like that, and again, account numbers. So there's a lot of places that, that information can be retrieved from. For the most part, our communication lines are really pretty good. If you are encrypting stuff in your communications, which in most cases you are, whether you know it or not, um, at least with respect to web communications, uh, not necessarily email, but with web communications, when you log into a bank, what do you see? You normally see a little padlock that appears on your web browser. And you normally see HTTPS in the address bar. That means that you've got a secure session going on. Because everything's being encrypted in that particular session. So that's a good thing here. Unfortunately, you can still lose data here and here in that same communication. If somehow you got a virus or a worm or something like that that's, that's installed a keylogger, it doesn't matter that it's encrypted. You're still going to be sending all, every key that you type into that computer to whoever's tracking your, your, your keystrokes. Internet vulnerabilities. Let's see, do that? I go back. Uh, internet vulnerabilities. Networks open to anyone. Anybody can get an, an internet account, even if you don't have an internet account. Go to the library. You have access. Virtually everybody has access. The size of the internet means abuses can have wide impact. It doesn't take that long for something like a worm to spread around the world. In fact, it can happen really in just a few minutes, uh, depending on where a worm is released, uh, how vicious it goes out after a particular vulnerability, and how bad the, the or how many machines around the world have that particular vulnerability. The use of fixed internet addresses with cable or DSL modems creates fixed target, uh, targets for hackers. Say what you will about dial-up. 
one real benefit about dial-up, or two benefits about dial-up, where one, you were only online when you were online. With broadband, whenever your computer's on, you're online. So you're virtually online all the time. Whenever the computer's on, you're online. It's not the case with dial-up. With dial-up also, whenever you dial in, what, what did we talk about previously about network? That you receive an IP address, every computer has a unique IP address. Well, when you log in with dial-up, you receive that IP address. When you log off, that IP address is released. It's supposed to be. Eventually, it'll get reassigned to somebody else. With broadband, because you're always on, you've got that same IP address for a much longer period of time. So you've kind of got a, a moving target. Uh, so it's a little bit safer. So again, you don't have that, that speed, but uh, there are certain benefits to it. Uh, unencrypted voice over IP. If you're making, you're talking across the internet, somebody can listen in. There's nothing encrypted about that. Whenever you encrypt something, it adds overhead, and especially with things like video uh, and voice where speed is, is really important, as little overhead as possible is, is going to result in better performance. So we don't tend to encrypt voice over IP, so anybody can listen in potentially. Emails also uh, not encrypted uh, as a rule. Uh, there are certain encryption approaches that you can take, but the vast majority of emails not encrypted. So you shouldn't be sending uh, credit card numbers or uh, social security numbers and things like that across email. So a lot of that stuff can be intercepted, things like that. Any questions so far? Wireless security challenges. Radio frequencies are really easy to scan. I mean, if you've got a, wire, a, a notebook, you can drive around and just a second, we'll get to that, but you can drive around with a, a, a laptop or a wireless uh, enabled device and look for networks. And in fact, you can fire one up here and you'll see two or three different networks in this building. Um, and that's largely because they're very easy to scan and they use SSIDs. Whether you turn on SSID or not doesn't really matter. You can find it even if it's turned off, uh, if you've got the right equipment. But an SSID is basically the equivalent of an access point opening up the window, opening up the door, and yelling, hey, here I am. If you want to use me, I'm right here. And, and that's really the purpose. Is that the, uh, the use for that is so that legitimate users can find the access point and attach to it and then receive email, receive uh, uh, web services and things like that. That's the plus side. The downside is, is it also <coughs> tells people that would abuse the system, hey, here I am, you can use it. Uh, so it does have a legitimate use to identify access points. I'll come, I'll come back to this in just a second, this word driving. Unfortunately, one of the things that happens with SSID and web is web is what, what they call wired equivalent, uh, wired equivalent privacy. It's a really horrible name for it because it has not, it, it's in no way equivalent to wired, uh, wired communications. The downside to SSIDs and web is they periodically broadcast, when you're using them as a, as a client, it periodically will broadcast in the clear part of the SSID and part of the web key. And so with enough communication going back and forth between a legitimate user and an access point, somebody that's listening in can eventually end up finding out what your web key is, your encryption key is. And after that, they have access to your network. So that's a, a, a real problem, a real weakness in WEP. Now, WEP was the original uh, um, encryption protocol for wireless. It's the oldest, it's the most efficient, but it's also the most vulnerable. And so it's been replaced by a couple of different uh, standards that we'll talk about a little bit more here in a minute. But keep in mind, just because you're using WEP, it, it's a bare minimum level of security. Uh, war driving is a process of just driving around looking for access points. And in a lot of cases, something they didn't talk about in the in the uh, in the book is a, a process called war chalking. That's basically performing war driving, driving around, identifying these various uh, uh, wireless access points, and then marking on the side of the building with chalk, saying, "Here's an access point that's open. Here's an access point that's that's secured, so that when maybe you come back to that one, do a little bit more work to crack it." Um, that's basically.
basically the process of listening in. That's all that, that slide's trying to show. Malware produces its own set of system vulnerabilities, and you've got a lot of different types of, of malware. The book just talks about some general classifications of malware. Viruses get thrown into that worms, Trojan host, uh, kind of Trojan horses. Viruses are basically programs that involve some kind of user interaction. You've got to click on a file. You've got to uh, run it. You've got to do something for it to be able to, be able to deliver its payload. Now, payload is going to be virtu can be virtually anything. It can be something very uh, simple. It changes the time on your computer. It flashes a, a little pop-up on your screen. It, it can be something that's very innocuous like that. Uh, or it can be something that's devastating. It can be something that formats your hard drive. You lose everything that you've got. Uh, so viruses, you know, you really do have to take viruses viruses pretty seriously. But they do involve some kind of user inter interaction. Worms are a little bit different, though. Worms don't require user inter interaction. In fact, that's how they spread so quickly. Uh, that when they get released in the right place in the world, at the right level, uh, uh, with respect to various systems, that are connected to the internet, they can spread very quickly, potentially, depending on the vulnerability. Uh, but they can be very similar in that they have their own payloads, they have their own ways of identifying uh, potential uh, targets, things like that. Everybody knows the story of the tro Trojan horse? Delivering the Trojan horse, uh, uh, so Greek soldiers hidden inside. Uh, basically, a Trojan horse is a program that looks legitimate. Usually it's a game, something that's you know, a cute little game, and you're kind of playing around with it. And you, you install it, you run it, you play with it for a little bit, and then you forget about it. What you don't realize is that in a lot of cases those programs have a Trojan in, 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 included in them, which is a secondary program that runs without you knowing it. And that secondary program may be a keylogger, so it's monitoring the keystrokes that you type as you type, and periodically sending back that file, that, that, that uh, information that you've typed in, back to somebody else's IP address or somebody's email. So Trojan horses are, are the types, types of things that can really be bothersome because you don't even realize that you've done anything and they're still running in the background. Anybody heard of SQL injection? SQL injection is a process where basically somebody, what have we talked about so far as far as, as uh, websites and backends and how you access databases. We have a web server and it accesses, you fill in a form and it accesses the backend database. Well, when people aren't coding their websites properly and you have a form that you fill out the information, you may have a form that has a field that say has 15 characters in it. Well, with if you put in the right characters into that data and in the database it's only designed to handle say 14 characters, you can create an SQL, an SQL injection attack in which you can potentially access the administrative properties of that database because it wasn't coded properly. You didn't do error checking at the web on the web server end of things. And that allows you to potentially, again, access a web, uh, a, uh, uh, the database with administrative privileges. What does that give you? Well, now that gives you access to potentially credit card numbers, Usernames, addresses, things like that. So you have a lot more access to things that you really shouldn't have access to. Spyware, small programs install themselves surreptitiously on computers to monitor user web surfing activity and serve up advertising. Especially if you've got an older computer. You, you, when you bought it, it was really fast. Everything worked great. But the more you surf, the more it starts slowing down. It's slower and slower and slower. You start ending up with more and more pop ups. Install your pop-up blocker and it's working great. It's blocking a lot of pop-ups, but the more pop-ups it has to block, it slows down more and more and more. The chances are you've got some kind of spyware on your system if that's the case. It's it's your browser at that point is so busy blocking block-ups, it can't respond to your requests. So spyware gets is pretty prevalent, especially if you don't have a an antivirus solution or if you don't have a malware solution, um, you're going to have all kinds of problems eventually. We've already talked about keystroke loggers. Uh, they do have, uh, um, uh, let's see that. Come on, let's see that. Okay, hackers and crackers. Anybody heard of that term? The, the term crackers? What's it, anybody know the distinction between the two? Yeah. Well, the cracker generally 
takes existing software and, and disassembles it essentially and figures out what they want to figure out and changes stuff to it. A hacker is more just coming in from outside utilizing other tools, I believe. A hacker, a cracker is what people traditionally think of as a hacker. Cracker is someone who a hacker is is someone who's just breaking into a system for fun. They're just trying to play around, and see how it works. They're not trying to do damage. They may do damage by accident. That's not their goal. Their goal is really just to try to figure things out. A cracker is somebody who's actually doing it for some kind of gain, whether it's you know, political in nature, they're getting some kind of money from somebody, whatever the purpose. That's a cracker. And you've, the the Various movies that you've seen over the years really kind of glorified. They kind of dropped this whole cracker uh, uh, terminology for some reason. Uh, I guess they felt hacker was more glamorous, but uh, it's a real distinction. And if you if you talk to hack tr to true hackers, they really kind of object to to it. Um, they they don't like being included with uh, people who are crackers. Uh, activities include system intru intrusion, system damage, cyber vandalism. It's another thing the book doesn't mention. mention. There's this whole class of, of uh, hacktivists that basically will hack certain websites that they don't necessarily agree with politically uh, in some fashion. A few years ago, there was a company, uh, I don't recall the name of the company, it was a company that, that did a lot of work in the open source area. And open source, you're not supposed to charge for things. You're just not. You can charge for support services. You can support, uh, charge for uh, things like that, and, and, but you're not supposed to charge for the, the actual uh, um, code itself. And they started suing other companies because of intellectual pro for intellectual property, which, again, with open source, is supposed to be open. As a result, you ended up with certain activist groups that started hacking their website kind of as a retaliation for what they were doing. They didn't agree with what they were doing uh, in the court system, so as a result, they were trying to fight back in that measure, in, in that manner. And you see that in other, other cases as well. And it's referred to as hacktivism. Um, let's see, spoofing, misrepresenting oneself by using fake email addresses or masquerading as someone else. So basically, spoofing an address. When somebody spoofs an address, I want you to believe that I'm Dr. Schultz, downstairs, so I spoof who I am uh, through an email. Maybe I use her email address somehow when I send you an email message so that you think it came from her. Uh, you can also re redirect a web link to an address different from the intended one with site masquerading as the intended des destination. A sniffer program has actually two different types of uses. It has legitimate uses and it has illegitimate uses. Um, from the legitimate side of things, you have network administrators and, and people who are trying to optimize networks who might use a sniffer to try to identify where the most traffic is, is originating from on the network. That way they can figure out optimal ways to segment data. They can figure out what protocols are on the network so that they can prioritize some protocols and, and deprioritize de other, other protocols so that you can improve network performance. So there are legitimate reasons for network sniffers. But at the same time, you can use a sniffer as a way to listen in to the data that's going across the network. Remember that voice over IP that we talked about not being encrypted? That's how you would listen in to their conversations. That's how you would look at people's email emails that were going across the wire. So when you type in the credit card number that you send to your friend in, in e via email, because email is not encrypted, you're sending that in plain text. Anybody with a sniffer can listen in on it. Denial of service attacks, flooding the server with thousands of false requests to crash the network. I was trying to think of an example for this, and, and I thought back to high school, being a kid, playing soccer, and you, you finish your, your game, and, and you get back on the bus, and you're headed back home, and one of the things they always do is you stop at, the, at a, a little restaurant, Wendy's or McDonald's or whatever you eat. And so I got to thinking about that. That example is a denial of service attack. If you're the person that pulls up into the driveway right after that bus unloaded, you're not going to get service for quite a while. So you've been denied service. 
A distributed denial of service tax is when 50 buses show up from different schools. Now it's because they're coming from everywhere. So the example is, is it relates to information technology is you want to go to a web address, you type in www.microsoft.com. Well, the web server is supposed to respond and give you the correct page. But if there's so many requests coming in from a client, from some other client, that that web server can't send you the page, you've been denied that service. A more effective technique, denial of service attacks really aren't that effective anymore. We have uh, various network approaches that basically allow you to shut those connections down so that that's not a real problem anymore. That's where distributed denial of service attacks come in. So now all of a sudden you have hackers that take over machines from around the world and can launch denial of service attacks from those various locations, making it a dis distributed denial of service attack. And now it's much more difficult for the web server to say, hey, I want to deny those connections because they're coming from all over. They don't know, the web server doesn't know which ones are legitimate and which ones are not. Is there any questions over so far? No. Computer crime. Find us any violations of criminal law that involve the, a knowledge of computer technology for their perp uh, perpetration, investigation, or uh, prosecution. Computer may be either the target of the crime or maybe the instrument of the, of the crime. Maybe the target if it's got proprietary information on it. What if it had the, the, the formula for coke on it? Or, you know, 11 herbs and spices, whatever the, the various recipes are. Uh, some kind of corporate data on it, or it had credit card numbers, or contact information for if you're a sales rep, or something like that. Those would make that computer a, a potential target for the crime. At the same time, it may be simply the instrument of the crime. You may use a computer to harass somebody at work or harass somebody in the neighborhood. Uh, you may use it to break into other computers to steal things. So a computer really can be either one or both, the target of crime or the tool of crime. Uh, identity theft, we watched the, the video at the beginning in terms of identity 2.0. Identity theft, theft of personal information, social security ID, driver's license, or credit card numbers to impersonate someone else. It's pretty easy to destroy your credit. It just is. It's really hard to build it back up. So it's something you really want to monitor is your credit report. Uh, because identity theft does happen. And it's, that's just a fact. So uh, try to be careful with your social security number. Don't share it all over the place. I think uh, it's probably less of an issue today. But you know, there's a one point in time where your student ID was your credit card, was your, your, your social security number. That's a real problem because people just got used to sharing their, their social security number with everybody. They, they almost had to. But it makes it really easy to steal people's identity. Uh, phishing, setting up fake websites or sending email messages that look like legitimate businesses to ask users for confidential personal data. You ever get those emails from Chase? Old time. Yeah, I get them. My, inbo my inbox, my personal inbox has probably got a thousand messages in it right now. And 95% of those are spam. And probably half the spam are those messages. I mean, it's it's horrible. The thing to keep in mind, these people are trying to steal your information anyway. Of course they're going to steal Chase's logo. It's going to look legit. The more legit the email looks, the more legit that the websites that they send you to look, the more likely you are to participate. That's where the Facebook thing really is problematic because there's over 500 million Facebook users. Everybody has those accounts. If they can customize using, through phishing techniques, customize those emails so that they look like they're legitimately from Facebook, you're much more likely to respond if you have a Facebook account. You're much more likely to respond to a Chase email if you have a Chase account. What I always liked was the ones when I got one from Point Bank that I don't have an account at. Well, I know that's some kind of spam or, or phishing attempt. Evil twins. Evil twins it refers to a, a, an access point that's at a site that you might normally think there would be an, an access point at. The, the airport's a good example. You go to the airport, you expect there to be access points available there. In some cases, they're free. In some cases, they're not. But you expect there to be access points there. Well, an evil twin approach would basically say, yeah, here, here I am, I'm an access point, and they're going to let you access so you can get access to the Internet. 
That's very nice of them, isn't it? You've got free access to the Internet as they listen in to every single communication that you have. Now, again, if you're doing banking and it's an encrypted uh, session, the bank has their encryption set up properly so that it's an encrypted connection, you're probably going to be okay. They're going to be able to monitor everything you do, but all they're going to do is see you know, random numbers, so it's not going to mean a lot to them. But what if the bank makes a mistake? Or what if the social site that you're using makes a mistake? Or what happens if you're checking email and stuff's not encrypted? Again, you have that potential to really open yourself up. Farming redirects users to a bogus web page even when individual types correct web page addresses into his or her browser. Anybody think how that might work? You type in the right ad, you type. Let me back up for a second because that's probably an important distinction. When you get one of those email messages that looks legitimate and you see a link, number one, you should never click on the link because it's pretty easy to, to um, make the link say one thing but actually go to another thing. So you should never click on the link directly. You should always go to your web your open up a browser, type in the address to your bank or, or wherever, and access it that way to verify whether or not it's legitimate. Uh, another thing you can do is you can highlight that link, and usually when you put the cursor over the over the link and look down on the bottom left hand corner, it will usually tell you what that link is actually going to. So if you if it says Microsoft.com and you hover over it and you go down to it and it says HackersRS.com, you probably shouldn't click on it. You're probably not going to be so lucky that it's going to say HackersRS. I'm just saying. Um, farming though kind of takes all that and throws it out the window because you can open up your own browser and you can type in the legitimate address and end up at the wrong place. How might that happen? Any guesses? That's one letter. That is one thing that happens, absolutely. Like a sponsor watching it they'll this or disrupt part of the city. Let me come back to this one first and then I'll step into the next one. Uh, yes, website uh, some people will actually set up websites that actually that look like Chase.com, but it, it's slightly different. Maybe somebody types in the number incorrectly. Or they'll have a link that says Chase, but instead of the yes, it's a five. So it looks almost like Chase.com. Uh, so you can have those types of situations where somebody might type in the right thing or think they type in the right thing, but they get redirected to a bad page. What they're referring to here is when somebody breaks in to your ISP and alters their DNS server, or on your machine, they redirect if they have physical access to your machine while you're not there, they can change the DNS server that your machine looks to. Either one of those approaches will work. How does the, remember how the internet works? We talked about last week. That DNS server is what tells them what IP address that you're supposed to go to. So when your machine goes and looks to the DNS server, instead of looking at the correct DNS server, it's looking at a DNS server that's being run by whoever these hackers or, or, or people are. That DNS server, instead of sending you to Microsoft.com, sends you to Hackers R Us. And it looks like a legitimate website. So uh, that's a way that you could be perfectly 100% secure on your end and still end up at the wrong place. Uh, click fraud occurs when individual or computer program fraudulently clicks on, on online and ads without any intention of learning more about the advertiser or making a purchase. I had a friend I went to school with, and uh, before he went back to school, he had a, a, a medical imaging company where all he was really involved with was taking high-resolution images, medical images, and transferring them across the Internet to people that needed them uh, to be able to di make diagnoses and things like that. This is back before it really became popular the way it is today. And the reason he, he kind of got out of it was because the competition started heating up. And one of the things he told me was he started to notice some of his competition were using ads to be able to, to uh, advertise. And it was really kind of driving him crazy because it was eating into his business. So he kind of jokingly said that what he liked to do was go to their online ad, or go to their banner ads and sit there and click on them over and over again. Because he figured it was driving up their advertising costs. And, you know, it's kind of funny, but at the same time, it's fraud. 
So be, be aware of that. Uh, you've also got cyber terrorism and cyber warfare. Uh, these are things that you're seeing more and more. There was an attack uh, what, here a year or two ago on uh, Iran's infrastructure. Uh, you're seeing more and more investment from the Chinese uh, in both offensive and defensive capabilities. Uh, you see it in Russia, obviously the United States. You're seeing a lot of investment in this area. Okay, any questions so far? Is that a little good? Okay. Uh, internal threats. We, ten years ago, if you talked about security, whoever it was that would, would be up here talking would, would tell you, when it comes to threats, forget about outsiders. It's all about insiders. That's where the threats come from. And ten years ago, they probably would have been, been pretty dead on. Today, I'd say it's probably 50-50 stand as much threat from outside as you do inside. Uh, it, it's a trend that's, that's moving in that direction anyway. Uh, internal threats, employees that currently work for you, are obviously a big problem. Why? Because they work inside your company. They know where things are. They know policies. They know procedures. They have much more physical access than people that are outside. But outsiders, because we connect everything to the Internet, You've got a lot of potential people that are, are potentially coming after you. Um, one technique that tends to get used quite a bit, social engineering. Anybody heard of social, enge social engineering? What you ought to do is take look up uh, sometime when you get a chance, uh, either the book or in YouTube videos, uh, a guy by the name of Kevin Mitnick. Kevin Mitnick was, this, he's a guru at, at social engineering to the point that he spent some time in prison over it. Now he has a security consulting firm in, uh, I believe, New York City. Um, but he's a master at social engineering. Social, social engineering is something that basically preys on us as, as, as people and preys on our how we interact with other people. We tend to say thank you and bless you and hold the door open for people. Well, if you're at a secure facility, and somebody's sitting there talking on the phone by the door, and they're like, okay, thank you, as you're walking up to the door. And they're finishing up their conversation on the phone as they start to make a move towards the door. Well, if you swipe your key card or do whatever it is you need to do to get into that locked facility, naturally you hold the door open for the person that's right behind you. That's social engineering. That's capitalizing on how somebody does things. That's walking through a facility with confidence not looking suspicious so that nobody asks you for ID. Social engineering. It's calling up on the phone and saying, yeah, this is such and such tech support. I need your act, your, 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 we're doing some account checks and I need your password so I can log in and check to make sure your account's okay. Well, if you're there, unless you are yeah, unless you want to be disruptive, you provide your to IT personnel, you give them your password. You shouldn't, but people tend to do it. Software vulnerabilities are another problem. Commercial software always contains flaws. Why? Because there's more than two lines of code. You're going to have vulnerabilities. What I was just talking about earlier with SQL injection problems. People are not going to do data validation. They're going to have a, a field and a form that accepts 15 characters, but the database is only going to accept 14 or 13 or, or whatever. You're going to have codes in, in uh, uh, bugs in code and that's going to cause the potential for security problems. Patches get released periodically, and that's a way for, for you to try to eliminate those bugs. But keep in mind, sometimes those patches create problems in and of themselves. And that's what this section is about. So now, let's take a, a few minutes, and we'll give you about 10 minutes, and we'll go through and read this, uh, this one. This one's about um, McAfee, who issued a patch and had a problem with it. So. Go ahead and read that. We'll do the questions in order again. So the first question will be the first, uh, first group one, second question group two, etc. systems and configurations that exist out in their users' world. Yeah. 
and uh, they failed to teach to test each possible combination of operating system and that. Uh, they also made assumptions that everybody was using a more modern version of the software rather than the one they were actually using. They were running XP, and yet they, the programmers really led it were looking at Vista and some of the more modern versions of Windows as they were trying to fix it. There's industry pressure to be the first to market, to be the first one to release something. And so you've got this internal issue that says, get it done, get it done, get it done, rather than the test to make sure you don't screw it up. Get it done. Get it done, we'll get it right later. Exactly. And they made a major assumption to delete the service hooks file versus quarantine it. So once the mistake had been made, there was nothing there yet you could fix because it was gone. Yeah, I think that definitely addresses all three of those. Uh, I think one of their real issues was was the organizational aspect of, of not getting out in front of the problem and, and basically saying it's, it's not a real problem, it's small, it's not affecting that many people. And even if you're the one that gets affected, you really don't care that it doesn't, that it affects everybody else or nobody else. It, it's affecting you, and, and uh, that's all you really care about. Uh, group two, what was the business impact uh, of this software problem, both for McCaffey and for its customers? Well, we talked about, um, for McCaffey, definitely, like you said, it, it hurt the business relations. Obviously, if you're one of the ones that's affected, or even the one who's just heard about it, um, you're going to be less likely to want to do business with them in the future. Um, even if they come out and do a public apology, it's still one of those things like, oh, I don't know. And they did. If I go with them, yeah. Uh, if I go with them, I might have my system crash, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as far as the, um, the customers, obviously there was a little a, a delay there, lack of productivity. There might have been some information they were never able to recover. Um, now they have the decision of whether or not they want to continue to do business with this or if they want to invest in, in new software with another company um, to another antivirus that they might Certainly, it puts a lot of pressure on a company because even, even you have to have an antivirus solution. You just have to. And if something like this occurs that ticks you off as an organization to the point that you want to get rid of their product, well, that's fine. But if you've got 10,000 machines, that means you've got to go out there and uninstall McAfee on 10,000 machines. You've got to buy new licenses for another company, another company's solution, and then go out and install that on 10,000 machines. Now, there's some automated solutions that help you to, to, to install stuff on a lot of machines, but nothing's perfect. Even with those automated installers, there's going to be machines that don't register on the network properly, and so you physically have to go out and touch those machines. It's a lot of work, and it's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort. So certainly it has a huge impact, not just on the fact that you've got machines that are down, but in whatever solution and whatever way you decide to deal with dealing with McAfee from that point forward, that's a problem. Um, let's see, group three. Uh, if you were McAfee, uh, a McAfee Enterprise customer, would you consider McAfee's response to the problem acceptable? Uh, we looked at it both ways. I guess from what it said, their solution with the uh, super bad tool was the only way that it could have been fixed. Um, if you look at it as a customer being an uh, enterprise, like the, you know, you're just talking about the massive amounts of machines that it took for somebody to individually do it, um, you know, maybe they could have sent out the employee to do it for the company. Uh, there, I guess there always could have been something more they could have done. Um, I'm sure the customer, you know, being uh, mad with them for what happened. Uh, I think Honestly, it's, in my opinion, I don't think they could have done much more for the customer. I think it's a, it's a tough situation to be in if you're McAfee because you do have this pressure to deliver a solution very quickly because you know, viruses can cause a lot of potential damage. They can uh, be security breaches that, that release uh, um, personal information, credit card, sensitive information, things like that. So there is that real pressure to get stuff out there because that's what your customers are demanding. But at the same time, and McAfee does have a very good reputation. They've always had, had a very good reputation for the most part. Um, you've got other players that are on the market that are very big and very popular and have worse reputations. 
and, and I don't want to talk, I, I don't want to mention Symantec by name, but that's one of them. Um, having said that, you, you make customers mad and, and they will switch. And I'll, I'll read part of that blog here in just a second. Uh, not so much his response, the CEO's response, but some of the, the uh, responses to his blog posts, just because I, I think they're pertinent. Uh, group four, what should McAfee do in the future to avoid similar problems? How do you produce a solution quickly like your customers want, but that don't cause problems like this? I don't think it's really feasible to test every version all the time, but certainly this kind of goes back to what you guys are talking about. You've got to test on the major systems first and foremost. And, and this was here a couple of years ago. I mean, companies were not switching to Vista. Vista was not a popular operating system. 7 was just coming out. Everybody's on XP. Why are you not checking all various configurations on XP first? Uh, it seems to me like that would be a no-brainer. That's on the testing side of things. I think they're really that they're, their biggest problem was on the way they handled it after the fact. Um, people are much more forgiving if you admit that you made a mistake and you take proactive steps to fix it. But to sit there and deny it and say, no, it's not a real problem or you're the only one, and then you find out later that, no, there were a lot more people that were affected, um, kind of feel betrayed by that that person or by that company. So I really think the way they handled it after the fact was was perhaps their, their biggest problem in all of that. Um, I was just going to read a couple of the responses to his, his apology. Uh, let's see. One of them was, uh, this one person said, this seems very negligent. When you have an act of negligence, you have to get out in front of it. You have to show everybody that, uh, that you're going to take care of it as quickly as you can. Uh, Windows XP is actually used in ticketing systems and in security systems. So when the failures hit, it can be uh, incredibly widespread. Some of these large companies were shut down for the day. They are never going to get that money back. And you start talking about systems that are involved with recording security uh, footage, for example. You know, that's, that's a security problem, obviously. Uh, companies that are processing transactions, those computers go down, you can't process transactions. Uh, what about, you see more and more restaurants that are using operating system-based cash registers. What about uh, hospitals that include those, those operating system cash uh, uh, machines in the, in, their, in the hospital? That's bad when those machines go down. Uh, another one was... First of all, let me say I'm glad that we have switched nearly 75% of our clients away from your product prior to this happening. Uh, I can't imagine the chaos if we hadn't. It was chaos enough for us running all over town and billing our clients for a software glitch on a program that we recommended to them. You have other companies now taking a, uh, a reputation hit because of this faulty product, system integrators. Good. Uh, let's see. So... You do have that, that real problem, and a lot of it, like I said, I think it stem, a lot of it stems from customers demanding those, those uh, uh, really quick updates. It used to be you'd patch once a month, and then all of a sudden it was you'd patch once a week. And now, especially with antivirus, you patch every day. I mean, you set it up to automatically do it, and you don't even think about it. The business value of security and control. Failed computer systems can lead to a significant uh, or total loss of, of business function. Again, if those machines go down, you can't conduct those transactions. That problem that I was talking about earlier with eBay or Amazon or whoever it was, when the, the website was being, uh, uh, the DNS servers were redirected, you don't have any business. It's not a case of getting some sales. It's gone. And when that's your only business, that's a lot of money. Think about it if you make a million dollars an hour and you're down for two days out of a year. That's a lot of money. 
And that's, you could do that. Think about uh, that works out to like eight and a half billion dollars or something annually. You know, companies make that. Firms now more vulnerable than ever. Confidential personal and financial data is all going online. We're storing everything online. Trade secrets, new products and strategies, we store everything online because it's, it's easy, because it helps us gain access throughout the organization to important data. But it also potentially opens us up to people that want that data more than we do, maybe. A security breach may cut into a firm's market value almost immediately. There's a study that, that's referenced in the book that says that it has approximately a 2.1%, I think, uh, impact on a firm's financial uh, stock price uh, if they're a large company. That translates to, I think it said, $1.6 billion. That's a lot of money. And that doesn't count you know, the, 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 the cost of actually having to fix the problem. That's just your stock market valuation. Inadequate security and controls also bring forth issues of liability. We talked about software before and having problems or glitches in software, and these firms not, you know, at least in the United States, not being liable for, for, those, uh, for those issues. But when you start talking about mistakes, now all of a sudden you are opening yourself up. When somebody does something wrong, you can now all of a sudden be held liable. You look at the TJ Maxx um, uh, a a as an example, which I believe the largest breach uh, in history, where I forget how many millions and millions and millions of, of records were, were lost, because it occurred over several years. They had a breach and didn't even know it for several years. Because of very weak controls, they did have controls in place. They were just really, really weak, far below standard. As a result, they opened themselves up for being liable. We've talked about controls, and we've talked about controls mostly from the organization's perspective so far. We've talked about procedures, for example. You, know, you must change passwords every 30 days or 90 days or whatever. We've talked about technical controls, installing antivirus in a software, things like that. But there's also regul regulatory controls that are out there that, in some cases, as an organization, they're placed on top of us that we have to comply with. So things like HIPAA, where we have to make sure that we have procedures and, and policies in place to protect uh, uh, medical information about, uh, about uh, patients. Graham, Leach, Bliley Act, and Sarbanes-Oxley about firms' financial records, how we're going to report those, how we're going to attest to the accuracy of, the, of those. SOX in particular is, is, a, is, a, is a bill that affects IT and accounting significantly. We have uh, uh, these records that we have to attest to, so we have to have solid accounting practices in place. We also have to make sure that IT is in place, that records can't be modified without somebody knowing it, that there's a record, that there's a trail for whenever records are modified or data is modified. That trail comes in the form of e-evidence uh, e or or uh, uh, electronic evidence. Evidence of white collar crimes often in digital form. Data on computers, email messages going back and forth, chat messages going back and forth. These all create a, a, a digital picture, if you will, of events, of what's going on, when events occurred, the order in which events occurred. And if it's something that becomes a legal case, that's very important to be able to create that picture. So you can, you can show who knew what and when. Proper control of data can save time and money when responding to legal discovery requests. Some of those laws we were just talking about, Graham Leach Bliley, Sarbanes Oxley, they have requirements for certain pieces of data and how long they must be held. Things like emails, for example, certain financial statements, things like that, that where data must be held for a certain period of time. You can have um, corporate policies, data retention policies that say how long you must keep them but they can't be shorter than what the, your regulations say they're supposed to be. At the same time, you probably don't want to keep those records any longer than you have to either. And you need to be consistent in your policy of how, you, how you're going to delete old data because you don't want to have a gap. You don't want to be keeping, if you're supposed to keep data for six years according to one of these acts, but you have a policy where you keep it for eight years, but you mysteriously have a few records that disappear around year seven and there's a financial issue that comes up, you're going to be held liable and potentially go to jail over those records that end up getting deleted because your data retention policy said eight years. So 
this can be really expensive if you're not doing a good job of, of maintaining your data because you've got to produce those records. In some cases, computer forensics can be used. That's going back in and trying to identify who did what, when, uh, that we were talking about a little bit earlier. But it's a very scientific approach to identifying data and how it's related to, 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 uh, uh, to, to events that went on. So it's the scientific collection, examination, authentication, preservation, and na analysis part. And then beyond that, it's also, also usually, in, in a lot of cases, presentation amongst, uh, uh, in a courtroom. Uh, includes recovery of ambient and hidden data. Anybody know what we mean by ambient data? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Ambient data is data that's gone to most users, but it's still there. Uh, when you delete a file, you're not actually deleting a file. You're just re deleting the reference to the file. It's still physically on the hard drive. If you have the right tools, you can go back and restore that, that, that file. So that's referred to as ambient data. Uh, information systems controls, manual and automated controls. Manual controls are just man-made things or things that you manually do. Uh, so things like locked doors, fences, things like that. Automated controls are, are things that you can set up to automatically be performed at a certain time or if a certain event occurs. Things like your antivirus solution, automatically update at midnight or automatically back up your hard drive to a location at 3 a.m. Things that you can automate, which really helps uh, an administrator's workload because they can, they can be accomplishing things while they're at home asleep trying to get, get a little bit of rest. Uh, but they can really be working on the network when the demand for network resources isn't as great. General control, another way to look at, at uh, information systems controls is general versus application controls. General controls operate across the entire system. Uh, so they govern design, security, and use of computer programs. We'll talk about some examples here on the next slide. Uh, and use of computer programs and security of data files in general throughout the organization's uh, IT infrastructure. Apply to all computerized applications. It doesn't matter whether it's Word or, or PowerPoint or, or whatever. Uh, and it's a combination of hardware, software, manual procedures, etc. So when we talk about general controls, it may have to do with, for example, encrypting all communications on the network or across our WAN link or, or whatever. When we do that, it's a general control because we don't care what kind of data is going across that link, whether it's email or it's uh, we're sending an attachment or web services, it, FTP, it doesn't matter. We're encrypting everything, so it's a general control. It's a little bit different than an application control. Now, with an application control, we're talking about a specific application and controls that we can put into that. So, for example, go back to Microsoft Word. You can protect a Microsoft Word document by password protecting that specific document. So it's an application layer uh, control. Uh, something else that's done quite a bit when we talk about security, we talk about risk assessment. They're trying to determine the level of risk to a firm if specific activity or process is not properly controlled. So the likelihood of something occurring and the impact that it's going to have if it should occur. So we can look at things like the type of threat, the probability of occurrence, potential losses, and from that, from that excuse me, we can calculate an, an expected annual loss. So I know it's at the bottom of the screen, but which one of these would you probably try to try to uh, protect first? What type of, uh, of event would you try to put controls in, in place first? A power failure. That's what I would do because of the price. Now, 98%, that would be pretty compelling because you have a pretty good chance you're going to have user error. But, you know, expected annual loss isn't quite as much. But because of the calculation, I... You, know, you can make a good argument for either power failure or user user error. Obviously, embezzlement's a big deal. Well, that's something that we hear about in the press, and that's something we want to stamp out. And I don't know about you, but I get used twelve hundred bucks. But so it, it, it's not that it's a non-issue. It's just not as important as the other two. We can create a security policy which ranks information risk, identifies acceptable security goals, and identifies mechanisms for achieving these goals. So once we've taken a look at our various uh, um, probabilities and our, our expected annual loss, 
we can start to create a policy around that to prioritize what we want to protect and how we're going to protect it through procedures, through software controls, through hard, various hardware devices, through various physical things like the locked server room doors, cameras, etc. Those are going to drive other policies, things like acceptable use policy. What can you use our systems for? Can you surf uh, the, the web, you know, personal time, uh, uh, personal websites on company time? Most organizations will let you do that a little bit, but you know, maybe we don't want to allow that. Certainly if you're in a, a, a government setting, a military installation, for example, they're going to crack down on that even, even more. Uh, we, we talk about Facebook all the time because it's, it's such a huge uh, uh, part of, of everybody's lives. But in a military setting, that's monitored. Military ac personnel's access to Facebook is monitored uh, quite stringently. Uh, authorization policies determining different levels of user access to information assets. Not everybody needs to have access to everything. And that's, well, we have a slide coming up on that here. Right there. I'll come back to this one. Uh, oh, that's captured access. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so not everybody needs to have the exact same access. So here we've got a couple of examples of, of different profiles. We've got one particular type of, of person. It's not a specific person. It's a profile. So we can create a group of users based on a profile so that we have a consistent, that that particular uh, group of users all have consistent access to the system. So for this particular employee, the type of employee, a personnel department clerk, they have access to all employee data including medical history, salary, and pension, pensionable earnings, they can read and update, but they can't see these, these three types of things. They can see information about that particular, uh, about employees, but they don't have any, they, they can read and they can update, but they can't see medical history, salary, or pensionable earnings. Now the divisional personnel manager, presumably the person above them, um, they only have read access to it, to that, that data, they don't need to update it. That's not their job. Their job is to manage these people. But they do have access to be able to see medical history data. They're not restricted from that. They're not restricted from salary. They're not restri restricted from pensionable earnings. The reason using things like profiles are important is it allows an administrator to, to quickly be able to create controls that have a consistent policy to a group of users so that you're not constantly, every time you add a new user, having to click on all the various checkboxes and do all the various configuration settings for each individual user. Why? What happens if you do that? You forget, or you give them the wrong access. You, yeah, you make a mistake. You drop down box and you click on the wrong one, the wrong radio button. You make a mistake. And you want to try to avoid that. So you try to automate as much as you can. Identity management. We talked about that just a little bit ago. Or the video kind of talked a little bit about identity management. Business processes and tools to identify valid users of the system and control access. Identifies and authorizes different categories of, of, of users. Specifies which portion of the systems can access authenticating users and protects identities. So it, it's basically... They're making a big deal out of it here um, as a separate system. A lot of your, your operating, your server operating systems have these built into them. Uh, so they're going to have the ability to create profiles. Uh, Windows Server, for example, has the ability to create profiles and manage these, these profiles. Okay. Disaster recovery planning and business continuity planning. These two um, have a lot of similarities. They draw from a lot of the same data. Uh, as far as inputs, but they are, are distinctly different. Disaster recovery uh, planning involves responding to a disaster, trying to get your system back up and going. How are you going to respond to a particular disaster? Business continuity planning has to do with continuing oper operations during that disaster. So just because you have a server go down a, a, as an e-commerce business, Presumably, if you can, you want to continue to make money. You want to continue to conduct sales. So business continuity plan says, how are we going to continue to take orders? We've got to figure out an alternative that we can implement until we can get our, until our, our disaster recovery plan gets our systems back up and running. Uh, both types of plans are needed to identify firms' most critical systems. 
identify all your various systems, and then you can start to categorize them or rank them into, in order of importance. Which ones do you need to get up first? Which ones are the most important? A business impact analysis to determine the impact of the outage, which ones are costing you the most money, and management must determine which systems are restored first. In a lot of cases, you identify a lot of this stuff through an MIS audit, examining the firm's overall security environment as well as controls governing individual information systems. So look at all your various systems that you have in place, which ones are the most valuable, what are the most likely events to occur, what's going to be your expected annual loss, all those various things. Then you can go back and do an audit. You can see where you are versus where you need to be. But the only way you can see where you are is if you perform an audit. So you're going to review your technologies. What kind of hardware and software do you have in place? How up to date are you with respect to patches? Procedures. Are you backing up your data on a daily basis? Do you do it once a week, once a month? Have you tested that backup? That's usually what happens. People are really good at, well, maybe that's probably not the right way to do it. Um, people are supposed to be really good at backing up their data. They're not. But uh, in a lot of cases, people back up their data, but they never bother to restore it. So they don't really know how good their backup is until they have a disaster. That's not the time to find out. Uh, you might even go through the process of simulating a disaster. Maybe you cut the power to the building to see how your systems handle it. Do the UPSs kick on? Do you have a, a, a backup generator that kicks on when the UPSs un uninterruptible power supply batteries get too low? So you can, you can go through and simulate a disaster. You can list and rank all your control weaknesses and estimate, estimate the probability of their occurrence and assess the financial and organizational impact of each threat. So you can kind of go through this process and create a matrix that identifies the various problems, uh, you need to have some kind of a feedback loop, some kind of mechanism where you report these issues up, uh, up through the chain of command to management so that they can make appropriate decisions. That's essentially what they're trying to give you an example of here. Uh, identity management software automates keeping track of all users and privileges, authenticates users, protecting identities. We've talked about some of this. I did want to talk a little bit about authentic authentication. What's the difference between authentication and authorization? That's one that tends to throw students. What is authorization? Giving permission to do something. Say again? Giving permission to do something. It's what you're allowed to do or not do. Versus authentication? You're who you say you are. You're who you say you are. That's the difference. And so we've got several different systems that we can do that with with authentication. You can't have authorization without authentication. You've got to start with authentication. You don't know what somebody's authorized to do unless you know who they are. It just makes sense. And we talk about some of the different authentication methods. And one easy way, easy classification scheme for these is, is thinking about them in, in, in one of three ways. Thinking about them in terms of what you know thinking about them in terms of what you have, and thinking about them in terms of what you are. So what do you know? Well, we usually know passwords, usernames and passwords. That's, that's an easy one. Uh, people are very familiar with how usernames and passwords work. What's the downside to passwords? What's several of the downsides to passwords? We forget them. They, we have easy to guess ones. Uh, we forget them if they have to be too complex. We write them down. We share them. All kinds of problems with passwords. But it's the most widely used form of authentication because we're, we know how they work. We've also got tokens and smart cards. and These are, are things that you might have with you. And when combined with passwords, they can be really pretty good. Um, an example of, of a token or a smart card might be your ATM card. You go to get cash, you can't just use your ATM card and get cash. You have to combine it with your PIN. At the same time, if you go up to the ATM machine without your card, you're not going to get cash. If you don't know the PIN, but you've got your card, you're still not going to get cash. So you've got to know something and have something with, with uh, tokens and smart cards. So it's, it's combining what you know and what you have. That's a, that's a big plus. We've got biometric authentication. What's that? 
fingerprints, retina scans, voice recognition, uh, facial recognition, palm recognition. There's a number of different types of biometric uh, authentication schemes. Um, and they're believed to be very good. I'll, I'll show you a video here in just a second that might change your mind on that. But that's what you have, or excuse me, that's what you are. The advantage to that is, unlike what you have, you're not going to lose your face, hopefully. You're not going to lose your thumb, hopefully. You're not going to lose your voice, hopefully. Um, so it's hard to lose, it's hard to forget, it's hard to share. So it's certainly, there's a lot of pluses to it. One downside is, is it's not perfect, and the, the uh, tools that you use to, to implement it tend to cost more. So it's, it's not something that's as, as cheap and easy to implement as a, a password system, and people aren't necessarily as comfortable using it as, as a password system. So let me show you a quick video uh, of this. Mythbusters. Let me kind of set this up just briefly. Okay. So, they're not perfect. Uh, what they don't really tell you in that particular part is that, that the, the door lock is a high dollar door lock. It's supposedly never been broken. Um, it's supposed to assess the, the, the uh, you want to describe it, the humidity or the moisture of your skin, your body temperature, in addition to the, the uh, thumbprint itself. So it's supposed to be much better than what the one was for the computer. But as you can see, you know, a, a, car, a copy uh, was enough. So authentication is important. Obviously, we have tried and true uh, methods with respect to passwords. Each approach has its own benefits and drawbacks. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, firewalls. We talked a little bit about firewalls last week in the in when we talked about networking. Uh, if you remember the video as the packet was going going uh, going along and it was getting tossed into the firewall, you had certain ports that were open, certain ports that were closed, and, and it would destroy those packets. That's the job of a firewall. And the term uh, firewall comes to us basically from architecture that we we have apartment buildings that get built and we install firewalls so that if we have a fire in one apartment it's more difficult to spread to neighboring apartments. That's what a firewall is designed to do. It's designed to keep the fire from the internet out from our internal systems. And we've got different types of firewalls, and they, they talk about another type in the book. They only listed three here. But the simplest and the oldest type is a static packet filtering. Basically, it's just looking for uh, um, uh, packets that are coming in that you're not looking for, that you're not trying to retrieve. So if somebody tried to access your, your computer system, a computer system internal to your network, if you, it wasn't requested from internally, it would be denied. The one they're not listing here is one that's called stateful packet inspection, which is really pretty common, especially in, in consumer routers. Uh, what it does is basically looks for the state of the packet. And what I mean by state is if we've got a communication going on with the server, what do we know about messages that are coming in? to our, our, our browser, we know that those messages have been broken up into a series of packages. Those communications have been broken up. And each one of those has a state. We have a sequence number. We have a, an originating IP address in, the, in those messages. We have a destination IP address in those messages. And by state, we can look at all those various numbers and make sure that it makes sense that we're receiving this particular packet. If all of a sudden we get a sequence number that is way out of order, Maybe there's something wrong with that particular packet, and so we might discard that. Uh, network address translation, using a different set of IP addresses for our internal network than what is available out on the Internet. It's a way to kind of mask what's going on internally to your network. And then application proxy filtering, or using a proxy, uh, a proxy firewall. Proxy firewalls give you some of the, the same benefits of traditional firewalls, but they give you the additional benefit of being able to cache web pages, which is basically saying we're going to store a copy of that, that web page on that proxy server. The advantage to that is if we have to go retrieve a page again, we don't have to go all the way out to the web server on the internet to retrieve that page. We can retrieve it locally from our, our proxy server. Our response time is much faster. The 
downside is, anybody think of the downside? There, that's, yeah, that's one of them. Is it our speed? That's a plus. Oh, if it's on the proxy server. Sense. Another issue is currency, or, or how current that page is. If you're accessing the web page that changes often, and you're accessing the proxy copy, it's, it, it, it can go out of date pretty quickly. So you have to refresh periodically. Um, so it kind of gives you a breakdown of how a firewall might actually work. Uh, you can have different types of firewalls. They can be hardware firewalls, they can be software firewalls, or they can be a combination of the two. In a lot of cases, what you'll have is a combination of the two, especially in a corporate type environment. You might have some kind of outer firewall that is usually a hardware firewall. The advantage to hardware firewalls, they're much faster, they typically do a better job, um, they're more difficult to get around. Um, but it's also a really good idea to have some internal firewalls as well, especially on your client, to have a software firewall on your individual clients. So you really have a couple of layers of protection, both at the client as well as at the, per at the perimeter. Another thing that you can use, another control intrusion detection systems, and they don't talk about it in the book, uh, but there's also intrusion prevention systems, and they're, they're, they're related. The only real difference is, is, is what they do in response to, to detections. Uh, a detection will monitor hotspots, so you're going to put it in areas of the network where you, you're going to expect uh, um, people to try to get into things like your, your uh, databases where you might store critical information. It's going to examine the events as they are happening to, to discover attacks in progress. A detection system is going to do all that, and it's going to be set up to basically send emails to an administrator and say, hey, there's a problem. You need to look into this. You need to do something about that. An intrusion protection system will go a step further and actually try to address some of the attacks by shutting down ports or maybe stopping communications from a particular IP address. It's, if it notices that it's being attacked from a particular IP address, it might shut down access from that particular IP address to your network. Uh, antivirus and anti-spyware software check computers for the presence of malware and can often eliminate them as well, quarantine, delete those those uh, uh, the bad stuff that's coming in. There's a couple of different approaches. The most common approach requires definitions, which means you have to update it. If you have an antivirus program and it hasn't been updated in, in five years, uninstall it. It's just wasting space on your computer. Uh, so it requires constant updating. If it's not updated, it's not doing you any good. There is another approach to antivirus and anti-malware, though, which takes a heuristics approach. A heuristics approach basically monitors your system for normal usage. It gets used to how you use your system. And based on that, then, when it when something strange happens, it, it recognizes that change in pattern, that change in behavior, and starts to lock things down, starts to quarantine certain things. So th that's a, a newer approach. It doesn't tend to be used as much because we live in a dynamic world, and so a lot of times you end up falsely identifying as uh, something as, a, as malware or as a virus, but it's really just because there's been a change in your, in your, your patterns of usage. Uh, there's unified uh, threat uh, management systems. It's basically recognizing that we have so many uh, uh, needs for various controls, it's becoming very difficult to manage our antivirus solution, our firewall, firewall solutions, our malware solutions, or, 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 or uh, spyware solutions. All these various applications that we use, it's getting hard to manage them from all these different locations. So we can end up with a, a, a particular package. Microsoft has one that's called Forefront um, that allows you to monitor all your various uh, security solutions in one place from, the, from, one, uh, from one dashboard. It makes it a little bit more user friendly. Okay, so we talked a little bit earlier about Securing wireless networks. Uh, web security can provide some security, uh, but it's really not very good. It's, it's marginally better than, than not having web enabled at all. Um, let's see. Ideally, regardless of the wireless security that you use, if you used a VPN on top of that, you're really going to be in pretty good shape. If somebody happened to break in through web, which is particularly weak, if you're still encrypting your data at the VPN level, you're going to be in good shape because even if they do intercept everything, it's all going to be encrypted. Wi-Fi Alliance finalized uh, WAP2 
specification of replacing web with stronger standards. It's a longer key. It's an encryption.